maintain that um, uh, new accomplishments. Uh, so think about how nurturing your resentment, Nietzsche thinks of as a kind of poison that the weak hold, whereas the noble are able to, you remember, I, I emphasized to you that the noble do feel resentment when they're hurt, because we're not, we're not all omnipotent. We can't always accomplish what we want. Other people do hurt us. But the nobles are able to shake it off. They're able to get on with their lives ra rather than nurturing this grudge and resentment. And that's the active power of forgetfulness that he's talking about here. OK, well, so exactly in those cases where we have strong and active forgetfulness, we have to find a way to overcome that exactly in order to be permitted to make promises. It's exactly that strength of forgetfulness which means that, so far, we're not able to commit to carrying out what we've uh, committed to. And so, the end of that first page, though. Precisely this necessarily forgetful animal in whom forgetting represents a force a form of strong health has now bred in itself an opposite faculty, a memory, with whose help forgetfulness is disconnected in certain cases, namely for those cases where a promise is to be made. It's thus by no means simply a passive, no longer being able to get rid of the impression once it's been inscribed, not simply indigestion from a once pledged word over which one cannot regain control, but rather an active, no longer wanting to get rid of, a willing <coughs> on, on and on of something one has once willed, a true memory of the will, so that a world of new strange things, circumstances, even new acts of the will may be placed without reservation between the original I want, I will do, and the actual discharge of the will, its act, without this long chain of the will breaking. What's the long chain of the will that he's talking about here? What's the long memory of the will? Why does the will have to be long? What does it have to leap over? So this is the, the gap, the time between um, I want, I will do, and the actual discharge of the will, its act. There's a gap between those. So in that gap, you have to hold on to that will and not forget it. Yeah, so what is the gap? I mean, what is the start point? What's the end point? What's, what's going on? Time out, you can make a promise one day. Right. You make a promise and say, I will do this, and then what happens? Then a week later it goes by, and then you have to fulfill that promise. That's right. Year, but Good. So it's all the things that happened throughout that week. Exactly right. So the gap is between the commitment and actually carrying out the act. Right? So I commit to doing something, I promise. And you have to hold on to that will. You have to hold on to that commitment, despite the fact that in the interim period between the time that you commit to the thing and the time you discharge that act, there have been lots of changes in the world. Circumstances have changed. Your own desires may have changed. And still, you have to not forget your commitment. You have to. Um, hold fast to the original act of willing, even in the world, even, even though there's a world of new strange things and circumstances and even new acts of the will. Right, so the problem here is precisely to hold on to that earlier commitment in the face of the active forget forgetfulness that's required in general for psychic health. Okay. Uh, the end of 
section one then. In order to have this kind of command over the future in advance, right, in order to be able to get ourselves in the future to do something that we're committing ourselves to now, in order to have this kind of command over the future in advance, man must first have learned to separate the necessary from the accidental occurrence, to think causally, to see and anticipate what is distant as if it were present, to fix with certainty what is end, what is means thereto, in general to be able to reckon, to calculate. For this, man himself must first of all have to become calculable, regular, necessary, in his own image of himself as well, in order to be able to vouch for himself as future, as one who promises does. Okay, so um, we have to be become calculable, regular, necessary in order for us to be able to commit to us doing something in the future now. Okay, so the question is, how did that happen? How did we become calculable, regular, necessary, so that we're able to commit to an act in the future? Precisely this is the long history of the origins of responsibility. So the story that he's about to tell about the origin of responsibility is how we became regular, how we became predictable, how we became calculable, how we put ourselves in the position to be able to vouch for our future wills. As we've already grasped, the task of breeding an animal that is permitted to promise includes, as condition and preparation, the more specific task, first make a first making man to a certain degree necessary uniform, like among like, regular, and accordingly predictable. So how did that happen? Well, he says, this work was done for the most part over a very long period of time, over our, he calls it our prehistory, and this was most of the time over um, human existence. Um, let me say again, each of things that this accomplished a great deal in making us regular and predictable and calculable gave us the capacity to commit ourselves to future acts, giving us the, as it were, permission or right to make promises. So this is a great accomplishment that took eons and eons in the prehistory of human existence. Of course, this prehistory, making us regular, making us calculable, um, this was also something that was, he says, was this entire prehistoric work has in this its meaning, its great justification. However much hardness, tyranny, mindlessness, and idiocy may have been, may have been inherent in it. So this long prehistory of making us calculable and regular is laced with much hardness, tyranny, mindlessness, and idiocy. It's not a pretty picture how we got this way, how we achieved responsibility. Um, but it's through, he says, this social straitjacket that man was made truly calculable and hence responsible. And this is, to say again, sort of our crowning achievement. Uh, this is the highest task that maybe nature has given to us. Um, it is genuinely a great accomplishment. Um, 
What it produced, he says, more specifically, uh, right after, right around maybe line 28, um, if, uh, if, on the other hand, we place ourselves at the end of the enormous process where the tree finally produces its fruit, where society and its morality of custom, this is a pre-moral system of values, morality of custom, of mores, finally brings to light that to which it was only the means. Then we will find, as the ripest fruit on its tree, the sovereign individual. The sovereign individual is the one who's responsible, who's able to vouch for himself, able to make and commit and stick to promises, even in changed circumstances, even in the absence of external sanctions. The sovereign individual, the individual resembling only himself, free again from the morality of custom, mores, autonomous. And he says, super moral. In short, the human being with his own independent, long will. The human being who is permitted to promise. What does he mean by a independent, long will there? What's the long will? The ability not to forget it over that Sure. To commit time. to your something now retain that commitment over time and changing circumstances and to carry it out in the future. And in him, a proud consciousness, twitching in all his muscles of what has finally been achieved and become flesh in him, a true consciousness of power and freedom, a feeling of the completion of man himself. So this is, just so we're clear about it, a great achievement for Nietzsche, the achievement of the sovereign individual with this kind of self-command and long will. This being who has become free, who is really permitted to promise, this lord of the free will, this sovereign, how can he not know what superiority he thus has over all else? It is not permitted to promise and vouch for itself. Uh, this is a great accomplishment that the individuals who have accomplished it recognize. Um, he sees that um, So he's vowed the person who has achieved this recognizes his own elevation and um, value above creatures that don't have such a long will, that are not sovereign individuals, that are not responsible. Those. So so what would. I don't want you to name any names, but I want you to describe such an individual who's not a sovereign individual in this sense. Describe what that human being or whatever would be like. They would probably lie. What? They would lie? Lie. Yeah, so maybe they would like say the words, I promise, but then what would happen? They wouldn't follow through. They wouldn't follow through or not. So they're not capable of, they don't have a long will. What does that mean? So they say, yeah, 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 I promise, I'll do this next week. And then what happens next week? They don't do it. They don't do it. Why not? They forget. Hmm? They forget. Yeah, so, it's, so they forget in a certain sense. But like you could remind them. And then what would happen? They still wouldn't do it. Why not? What's going on there? So I said that the sovereign individual, one who's responsible, one who's permitted to make promises, in the future may have there may be new circumstances, new desires, new inclinations that the sovereign responsible individual overcomes. This is a kind of self-discipline that's required here. They have no self-discipline. They have no self-discipline, exactly right. So the lower creatures who are not sovereign individuals, not 
committed to make a promise are going to blather on about what they claim